Lesson 2 of Chapter 5 deals with the roots of representative government in America. Um, what we're going to look at here are identify the rights that colonists expected as English subjects, evaluate how England's glorious revolution affected the colonies, and finally describe how most colonial governments were organized after the glorious revolution. As English citizens, the colonists expected to be provided with certain rights. These rights of Englishmen developed over many years. The first step towards guaranteeing these rights came when a group of noblemen forced King John to accept the Magna Carta, or Great Charter, in 1215. At the time, of the, king, at the, time the king needed money in order to finance a war. He traded rights for this funding. The Magna Carta guaranteed the following rights to noblemen and freemen. They could not have their property seized by the king or his officials. They could not be taxed unless a council of prominent men agreed, which established the parliament. They could not be put on trial based only on an official's word without a witness. And they could not be punished but by a jury of their peers. Over time, these rights were guaranteed to all English people. One of the most important English rights was uh, the right to elect representatives to government. Uh, Parliament, which is England's chief lawmaking body, was the colonist model for representative government. Parliament is made up of two houses. Members of the House of Commons were elected by the people, and members of the House of Lords were non-elected nobles, judges, and church officials. The king and Parliament were too far away from the colonies to run the day-to-day -day operations. The king had appointed royal governors to some of the colonies in order to maintain greater control over those colonies. English colonists wanted to have some say in the laws governing them, so they allowed the colonies to create their own lawmaking bodies. Colonists elected their own assemblies, similar to the House of Commons. Virginia's House of Burgesses was the first of these. In Pennsylvania, William Penn allowed the colonists to create their own general assembly. These two lawmaking bodies imposed taxes and managed the colonies. Although the colonists created their own legislatures, the king had ultimate authority over them. The colonists did not have representation in Parliament, despite Parliament's, Parliament's ability to pass laws that affected the colonies. In 1685, King James II um, came to power in England. Uh, King James, whenever he came to the throne, he wanted to rule England as an absolute monarch or with total authority. James worked to change the way that New England colonies were governed by canceling the charters of the colonies. James combined the New England colonies into one of the large colony called the Dominion of New England and appointed Edmund Andrews as the royal governor. He did this because in England they were, or in New England, excuse me, they weren't abiding by an old law that was passed in the 1730s known as the Navigation Acts. Andros abolished the colonial representative assemblies and allowed town meetings just once a year. With the assemblies banished, many Massachusetts colonists refused to pay taxes, claiming that it was unfair to be taxed without having a say or representation in the government. This slide focuses on those navigation acts that I mistakenly said were passed in the 1630s, but actually were passed in 1651. Those acts were designed to let England take advantage of some of the large profits that were being made in New England on trade. Uh, these acts, the navigation acts, said that any shipping that was going to be done uh, for England or on behalf of England must be done in English ships or ships made in the English colonies. Products such as tobacco, wood, and sugar could only be sold in England or its colonies because these products were sought-after products throughout all of Europe. European imports to the colonies had to pass through English ports before making their way to the colonies. So if France wanted to sell something to the colonies, they had to send it to England first, and then it would come to the colonies. Finally, 
English officials were to tax any colonial good not shipped directly to England before being sent anywhere else. Now, the end result in this is that most of the colonial governors just ignored uh, this laws, and they didn't hold the colonists to it. Um, in some cases, there was smuggling, and many families uh, became wealthy from selling their goods kind of on the black market. Uh, John Hancock's family is one of those families that became that were very prominent smugglers uh, about a hundred years after the Navigation Acts. He made a lot of his money in the mid 1700s as a smuggler. James II was a very unpopular king in England, um, not only because of his ideas of the divine right uh, of kings and things of that nature, but also because James was Catholic, and he made a lot of moves in order to um, bring the Catholic faith back to England. Uh, he banished Parliament whenever he became in power, sent them home, and after about three years, um, the people of England had had just about all they could handle of James the Second. So, in 1688, the English Parliament decided to overthrow King James for not respecting the rights of the Parliament guaranteed way back in the Magna Carta. James had been trying to pack the next Parliament with members who were Catholic in order to overturn anti-Catholic laws. Parliament, which had been dismissed in 1685, offered the throne to James's Protestant daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange. James had very little support in England, so he fled um, and William and Mary took over. This bloodless change of leadership became known as the Glorious Revo uh, Revolution, because nobody had to die in order for William and Mary to become king and queen. Now, af as they became king and queen, they did so knowing that they were going to have to sign a document that was going to give the English people in Parliament further rights known as the English Bill of Rights. So after accepting the throne, William and Mary agreed to sign this English Bill of Rights in 1689. The Bill of Rights was an agreement to respect uh, the rights of English citizens of Parliament and of Parliament. Under the English Bill of Rights, the king could not cancel laws or impose taxes without the approval from Parliament. He had to hold free elections and frequent meetings of Parliament. He could not uh, give excessive fines and punishments. And people were allowed to complain about the king or queen to Parliament. What this does, it established um, a very important principle in England, that the government was to be based on laws that were made by Parliament and not the desires of an absolute ruler. The Glorious Revolution's impact was felt all the way back into the colonies. After the Glorious Revolution, Massachusetts regained some of its self-government. They could elect representatives, but they still had a govern governor appointed by the crown. If you look in your textbook, the diagram on page 128 really describes the flow of power into the colonies. You have at the top the king and queen, William and Mary. They kind of give the royal governor some power. Uh, here we have a picture of Thomas Hutchinson, who was, when we get to revolutionary times, he was the royal governor of Massachusetts. He was appointed by the crown, he oversaw colonial trade in the Massachusetts colony, and he had final approval on laws. And at any time, he could dismiss the colonial assembly. Now, the colonial governor, uh, from that situation, you could have two other things that could happen, two things that could happen. The colonial gover governor could appoint a council, a representative council, uh, that would be kind of like an advisory board to the governor. Um, they, could, they would act as the highest court, the supreme court in each colony, and they would give the governor some information to help him rule. They didn't necessarily make laws 
um, and they weren't voted on for by the people. They were appointed by the governor. Or you could have your colonial assembly, similar to what we talked about in Virginia with the House of Burgesses or in Pennsylvania with the General Assembly. They were elected by eligible colonists. They made laws, and they had the authority to tax. It was from this colonial assembly um, that the governor's salary was taxed by the people and given to the governor. So they would decide what his salary was going to be, that colonial assembly. Now, this is going to come into play uh, in New York. We're going to see in a trial, in, in the Zenger trial, in just a few minutes here. During the first half of the 1700s, England uh, interfered very little with colonial affairs. This hands-off policy um, that England took towards colonial affairs was known as salutary neglect. And it's very similar to that laissez-faire term that we talked about before. It's basically they just allowed the colonies to run themselves. And the colonies did so. They took care of themselves up until we get to about the 1750s. Parliament passed many laws regulating trade and the use of money in the colonies. But in most cases, those royal governors, like Thomas Hutchinson that we see here, they rarely enforce these laws. Next we come to the Zenger trial. It was the last portion of our video here, and it is really important for us because this trial lays the foundations for what we call today the freedom of press. Uh, John Peter Zenger was a printer and publisher in New York City in 1733. His newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, began publishing articles that were highly critical of the royal governor of New York, William Cosby. After arriving in New York from London, Cosby began to quarrel with the Colonial Assembly over his salary. When they wouldn't pay him what he wanted, he removed the Chief Justice of the Colonial Court and replaced him with a justice from the Royal Party, someone who was going to be more sympathetic to the Royal Governor. Zenger's papers published a story about Cosby's action, and in, to which Con Cosby excuse me, responded that the paper's reports were scandalous, virulent, and false and seditious reflections of his character. Zenger was arrested and charged with seditious libel, meaning that he was trying to harm the reputation of William Cosby. After spending eight months in prison, Zenger went on trial. The trial lasted a few days, and it took the jury ten minutes to find Zenger not guilty of his crimes. Zenger's attorney, Andrew Hamilton, argued that the people had the right to speak the truth, and the jury agreed. Again, as I mentioned, this case is very important for us because it lays the foundation for what we now know today as freedom of the press. This wraps up our Lesson 2 video um, review of the lesson. Hopefully this is going to help you prepare for the exam, which will be coming up after we finish up Lesson 3, dealing with the French and Indian War.